Good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, students, and members of the public, visitors from other universities. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural lecture to be delivered uh, by Professor Rebecca Sandmeyer. Uh, if I just want to introduce, you, to introduce to you first the platform party. Um, starting from closest to me is Professor David Wardle, who's the acting dean of the Faculty of Humanities, and he will introduce uh, R Professor Sandmeyer, uh, then our inaugural lecturer herself, then Professor Winfried Ludemann, who will do the vote of thanks, and I'll introduce him just before he speaks, and Professor Mamacheti Pakeng, who is both the Deputy Vice-Chancellor and the Vice-Chancellor-designate uh, to become Vice-Chancellor on the 1st of July. The uh, series of, academy of inaugural lectures, uh, as uh, some of you will know, you may have attended others, is really represents a, a seminal moment in the career of an academic, uh, arguably the point to which an academic has aspired uh, all their lives, working up through the ladders of both qualifications and ranks um, to eventually be appointed to a chair or to be promoted to a, a full professor. And it provides an opportunity not just to celebrate that achievement, to celebrate it with, with colleagues and friends, but to uh, for the university to boast about its stars and its gems, to uh, put on display for the world, for the public, uh, and especially for colleagues from other faculties and other departments who often don't really know about the work of colleagues across the institution, to put on display uh, the new professor's um, body of work, work that they've been, uh, they've been doing up, up until that point with, um, and that has brought them to that point. And it is uh, designed, therefore, as a non-specialist lecture, a lecture which uh, people who are, in the case of, uh, of a musicologist, it's designed so that engineers and medics like me would also understand the lecture, as well as the, the general public. And so um, it's really uh, wonderful to have, have you all here today and to have uh, Professor Sandmeyer do the lecture. So allow me to introduce the dean, the acting dean, Professor Wardle, to do the introduction. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor, uh, Vice-Chancellor-designate, um, colleagues, students, and members of the public. It's a great pleasure to introduce Rebecca Sandmeyer on this occasion. She has a distinguished academic career and has made a wonderful contribution in the years that she's been at UCT. So let me rehearse just a, a summary of the, of the highlights of her career. She studied music and modern English at Trinity College Dublin and went on there to do postgraduate studies, which culminated in 1997 in a doctorate with the title Text and Music in German Opera of the 1920s. From there, she went back to Germany and between 1999 and 2008, was a Wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiterin in musicology at the Westfalische Wilhelms Universität in Münster. There she taught at undergraduate and postgraduate level, but was working on her second doctorate, her Habilitation, which she, she secured in 2008. And the subject of that was sacred vocal polyphony and early humanism in England, cultural transfer during the 15th century, using the example of the composer John Dunstable. We see already the vast chronological range in the musical interests of Rebecca Sandmeyer. After her habilitation, uh, she had short-term posts at Potsdam and Münster in 2009 and 2010, where Moving on from her habilitation, she then began to think about 19th century Germany and the way that the works of great George Friedrich Handel were received in Germany and were um, performed. And she took part in a, in a huge multi-author project which has created a, a fantastic resource uh, for knowledge about the performances of Handel over a long period. In 2011, she took the brave step to come to South Africa. 
and joined the South African College of Music as an associate professor in the musicology section. She continued her work on Handel and German oratorios in the 19th century, but while she's here, she has begun to acculturate herself and begun to explore the resources for research in this country, notably the manuscripts of the Gray Collection, which are held in the National Library of South Africa. In the College of Music, she has played a role in strengthening the area of historically informed performance, where we see her research feeding into teaching and leading to the creation uh, of new courses. As dean, I am particularly grateful to Professor Sandmeyer for her role as director of the South African College of Music, which she took up in 2014. That is a large and very demanding department, and she has handled them with great skill. If one's to indulge in stereotypes of the German, they believe in law and order and due process. And Professor Sandmeyer has brought great order to the curriculum of the College of Music. And in that, she has demonstrated an enormous grasp of detail. This is perhaps the most complex curriculum on offer anywhere in the university. And she has done much to make it intelligible to deans and <laughs> even to students of music. Beyond her strict academic role, um, Rebecca has making a contribution to South African society in the collaborative project between the College of Music and the Itemba Labantu Lutheran Community Center in Philippi. And she has made a, a point, and we see this in the inaugural lecture tonight, of bringing together the world of Europe from which she came and the world of South Africa in which she is now part. And she's going to present to us this evening a study on the life of Charles Etienne Boniface, a man whose life encompasses so many peripeteia that the stories of the operas which seem in the light of day to be utterly fantastic are utterly stayed and normal compared to this man. So, sehr geehrter Kollege, I invite you to speak to us on the title In Search of the First South African Composer, The Potholes and Pitfalls of Researching the History of Western Music in South Africa. Thank you. I invite my colleagues from the Platform Party to take their seats in the front row since there's going to be a visual. And just as uh, Rebecca comes to the, the podium, I omitted a very special welcome, and that is to Rebecca's mother, Mrs. Fritz, who has come out from Germany for the occasion. We're delighted to have you with us, and thank you for making the journey. Thank you, David, for the very kind introduction. Indeed, the title is In Search of the First South African Composer. About two weeks ago, I got a call from the Vice Chancellor. He was worried the title might be contentious. This was perfect. I was so chuffed because I wanted to make people think about the markers in the title. And it seems to have worked even before the title was published. He asked all the right questions. What are we looking for? We're looking for the first. The first can only really be determined when the other two categories are settled. So this is problematic. The other two categories are no less problematic. I don't want to go into identity politics about South African. The easy way out might be citizenship or birth. But even that is not so easy. If you go back in history, I mean, strictly speaking, South Africa only exists since 1910. 
since the Union of South Africa. And also the area is shifting in history. And even more problematic, the borders were not God-given. The borders were drawn by the colonizers. Also contentious or difficult, problematic, is the term composer. What comes to mind first is probably someone who writes music, probably Western music, on a piece of paper. This is a very limited idea of composing even within Western music. Western music starts as an oral tradition. So if you look at plain chant, for example, um, it's only written down very much later than it was composed. And also for a very long time, not everything that was supposed to be played or performed is written down. So the idea of the composer as someone writing music is quite limited, and it is even more limited if you look beyond Western music into traditions like jazz or traditional music. Therefore, depending on the interpretation of South African and composer, the search for the first might lead to quite different results. So I thought maybe looking at someone who has been called the first South African composer might provide some clarity. I'm a historian. The origin of the word or the meaning of the word has got, it's got two meanings. It's on the one hand to seek knowledge, to find out, to investigate. But on the other hand, it's also to tell a story, to construct a narrative to relate past events. So I would like to do both. And the story I'm going to tell you about a first South African composer has many layers. It's the story of my research journey, but it's also the story about this first South African composer. And it is a story about how his story has been told. I was sitting in the National Library of South Africa in the Special <coughs> Collections Reading Room. It's a lovely space. It's got the original 19th century panelling and the bookshelves, the smell of old books, the hushed atmosphere. It's just very great to work in. And the librarian comes and asks me to have a look at a book. This is the title page. The title page tells us this is a collection of songs. It's accompanied, they are accompanied by guitar or lyre guitar. Lyre guitar is actually the same thing as a guitar. It's just a different shape of body. So it still has six strings and the frets like a guitar, but the body is shaped like a lyre. It's very popular in France around 1800. Then the title page gives a short description of the content. It says the book was copied for Miss H.S. Hubert by a guy called C.E. Boniface in Cape Town, 1821. And by the way, he also calls himself Professor. Looking inside, it's very beautifully written. We always have the title of the composition and then where the composition comes from. So on the left-hand side, you see it's the couplets de l'Opera d'Aline. Um, and Boniface, or the writer, then says it's um, by Berton and the accompaniment by Boniface. On the right-hand side, you see Levant, an old topic on a melody that's not new. That's the subtitle. <laughs> Words and accompaniment by Boniface. All of the songs in the book are for a higher voice, probably a soprano, maybe the Miss H.S. Hubert. And the songs are quite easy to learn. The, the melodies are not that difficult. The accompaniments might be, <laughs> I hope I'm not saying anything wrong here, uh, the accompaniments might be a bit more difficult to learn. Um, but it's often a standard sort of broken chord guitar accompaniment. Sometimes it becomes a bit more adventurous, especially when the text also becomes a bit more adventurous. And we are very lucky today to have two of my colleagues here, Louise Howlett and James Grace, who are going to perform 
one of the songs. Um, there is no recording of these songs. They are probably now played and sung for maybe the second or third time since 1821 when the book was written. And I think we are very lucky to be able to hear one of them. Thank you.
thank you to Louise Howlett and James Grace. So in the book, not only on the title page, but also on many of the songs, the name Boniface appears. Who was he? What did he do at the Cape? So I started looking in the secondary literature. There's not much, but there's some information on his biography. He was born in 1787 as a son to a sympathizer of the French Revolution. The father then was banned to the Seychelles. Charles Etienne, he stayed with his mother in Paris and only went to the Seychelles after his father had died. He was probably looking for an inheritance. From there, he came to Cape Town. In 1807, he arrived here. He joined the amateur theater scene and adapted plays and ballets for that scene. Some of them contain music. He is also known to have been a teacher of languages and music, the Spanish guitar and singing. And he was one of the first people in the Cape who had a lending library for music. So you could go to him and borrow a music book and play it at home. Beside his musical activities, he was also active as a writer. He wrote satires and also um, edited a newspaper. In 1844, he left the Cape for Natal and he started similar activities there. Most of the secondary sources that one sees mention his literary output much more than his musical one. Um, passages in his writings use some very early form of Afrikaans, and the music is men just mentioned at first, and from the 1940s onwards, it's also discussed in the musicological sources. Those sources focus on two aspects. On the one hand, on the cultural historical significance of this person, and also on his compositions. Let's have a look at those secondary sources. So in 1928, this is the first time that Boniface's music is being mentioned, and it's actually in a literary, or in a source on literature. There he's said to be of great cultural, historical, and literary importance. In 1946, Bose picks up this theme. He says he's a dominating figure in the theater and music life of Dutch South Africa. Later, in the standard publication, the South African Music Encyclopedia, published by Jacques Pimalan, but the article is actually by Bose as well. Um, we again hear about the cultural historical significance, and he's been uh, named among the pioneers of theater, coupled with music and dancing. And the latest one I found is 1990. Lily Wolfowitz almost exactly repeats Bose's um, phrases. She calls him an important figure in the cultural history of this country, among the pioneers of theater, music, and dancing. Notice the almost identical phrasing between all of those sources between 1928 and 1990. Um, all of them say, look, he's been very instrumental in, in the foundation of um, uh, music and dance, and he's a literary figure. They also reference the cultural historical importance, but of course that is only to one part of the cultural history of South Africa. When we look at Boniface as a composer, we see quite similar things. So van der Merwe in 1949, this is the first article on um, Boniface's music, and it also contains reprints or facsimilia of, his, of some of his manuscripts. In 57, Bose again writes about Boniface in his um, book, South Afrikaans, the Komponist van van Dach en Giste. Um, he's mentioned there as the first in a series of later composers. And again, Bose in the Music Encyclopedia, that the melodies with guitar, guitar accompaniments can be attributed to him. So on the one hand, when it relates to the cultural historical significance, we get people copying from each other all the way through between the 1920s and the 1990s. And most of the writings about Boniface's music are actually by one person, Jan Bose. 
And those two arguments always repeat over and over again. After 1990, there doesn't seem to be any more research on Boniface's music, but there's quite a lot of research on his literary um, standing. So there has been a reassessment of his role in the formation of Afrikaans, but that is something I don't want to talk about. <coughs> So I was wondering, this is very strange, there seems to be a discrepancy between the secondary literature, what they say about Boniface, and what I see in the primary source in the music book. Boniface is very clear in stating where the music and the words come from. He says some of his words, some of the words are his own, most of the accompaniments are his own, um, but he hardly ever says that he wrote the music the melody. That made me curious. And I wanted to see, did I miss anything? Maybe there's more. And I searched to see what did he compose, what else is there. It's mainly songs, some for home entertainment, some for special occasions, and some for the theater. There's very little instrumental music. We know about a set of variation on a French folk song, and we also know about a sonata, but I haven't found the music yet. It's a newspaper advertisement for these compositions, but the music is maybe not extant, or I just haven't found it yet. Um, there's no church music. That is not really surprising. The guitar is usually not played in church. And also Boniface's literary output is quite satirical against the church. Um, he writes against the temperance movement, against the abolitionists, and also against humanitarianism. But of course, this might also be a manifestation of his anti-British stance. So, I now have a corpus of work um, by this composer where I've seen the music, and I would like to know whether he really wrote it. So I search for concordances. Can I find concordances either in text or in music? Some examples. Le 12 août, it's a song for a birthday. The title says, Words, Music and Accompaniment for Guitar by C.E.B. It's one of the few examples where Boniface actually says he wrote the music and I couldn't identify a concordance. In the plays, the plays follow typical vaudeville traditions. So Boniface writes a text, and then he states this aria, this song is to be sung to the melody of that song. Most melodies can be identified through this way. So either he says himself which one it is, or one can find them. It's a little bit different in this play, the Burger Edelman, it's a Moliere adaptation. On the title page, Boniface doesn't say anything about who wrote the music. The, and also in the play, he doesn't say use this melody, but he attaches a set of melodies at the end. And here too, I could not identify concordances. Going back to the music book, We've got 24 compositions, or 24 songs. Um, there's another song that is incomplete because two pages have been torn out of the book, and I can't identify because I only have the last page. Um, so out of those 24 songs, 11 concordances have been identified. I've seen the music, even though the text might be different, but the music is uh, some pre-existing song. Five concordances of texts have been identified. I haven't seen the music yet, so I'm still searching in French libraries for sort of old theater books that actually do contain music. Um, so I cannot confirm yet. And of the eight remaining songs, I couldn't identify concordances, but Boniface actually names three composers. So in the end, there are five songs where Boniface doesn't say this was composed by someone else, and also where I cannot identify someone else who might have composed it. Let's have another look at the two examples given earlier. The couplets de l'Opera d'Aline. Boniface says, music by Berton. 
And lo and behold, the music is from an opera, Aline Reine de Goyconde by Henri Montan Berton. It's in Act 3, Scene 2. And if you compare the melodies um, on the top line on the left hand side, and it's on the second from the bottom in each system on the right hand side, you can see it's the same melody. The introduction is a bit different, but remember uh, the opera is written for an orchestra. Boniface is writing for a guitar, so he changes it a little bit. So we've got the melody, the, the composition, in a uh, in an opera, in an early print, but we also find it in a collection of songs called La Clé du Caveau. The other one we saw earlier, Levin, Boniface says an old topic on a melody that's not new. Although they're different texts, because these words are by Boniface, the melody can be identified as number 156 in La Clé du Caveau. You can see, again, the top line on the left-hand side equa equates to the three last lines on the right-hand side. Um, the little rhythmic sort of variations, but it's basically the same thing. And it's again from this collection of songs, La Clé du Caveau. Quite a lot of concordances come from this source. It is a collection of melodies for French singers, amateurs, writers, actors of vaudeville, and lovers of French song. It relates directly to the vaudeville tradition. Vaudeville is basically a way of making new, a lot of new plays with lots of songs, and the, um, the texts are written anew, but the melodies for the songs are always the same melodies. So the songs are always in standard poetical forms. Um, the number of syllables per line and the number of lines per stanzas are the same, or there's just a few set forms. And the same is true for the melodies. So you can basically take any melody that fits the form to uh, be used for any text that is in the same form. Actors and authors used collections like this one, the key to the entertainment, um, to find the melodies for their songs, for the songs in the Woodville plays. And Boniface, most likely, was active in the Woodville scene in Paris before he came to Cape Town. He was involved in a production of a Woodville play in the very first year when he arrived here. So he must have known about this before he came rather than getting to know it here. Let's go back to the discrepancy between the primary sources, between the music book, the primary source, and the secondary literature. The evidence that has now been uncovered is actually more shocking than what was suspected by Bose. Most of the songs by Boniface are not his original compositions in both the music book and in the plays. Those that cannot be traced, I suspect, are most likely also not compositions by Charles Etienne Boniface. Because he's very clear in naming the composers and also naming who made the words and the accompaniment, and he hardly ever names himself. So, apparently, Boniface grew up in the French tradition of Woodville. He brought that convention with him to South Africa the melodies are named in the plays, and most of them come from La Clé du Caveau or similar publications. The accompaniments on stage were most probably improvised. The accompaniments in the music book are either for one of his students or they were for himself to accompany his students. So why then is he put on this pedestal as the first South African composer. Why is he seen as such a major figure in the history of Western music in South Africa? I think we need to look again at the secondary literature and at the context. When you look just as the, at the publication dates, um, we start with Bosman in 1928, mentioning the music of Boniface. This is a time of intense search for an Africana origin, for a history, for a culture. 
1921, the music for the stem was written. In 25, Afrikaans becomes an official language. In 1928, the stem gets a, a status similar to a national anthem, alongside with God Save the King. And in 1933, the Bible is translated into Afrikaans. Looking back at the secondary literature, the first publication, that 1928 book by Bosman, sets off a series of repetitions on the cultural historical significance of Boniface. Even though it's on his writings and connected to Afrikaans becoming a written language, this seems to have sort of migrated or been transferred to music histor history writing. It seems to have been politically opportune to have a local composer or music master active at the same time as the formation of written Afrikaans. And of course, the story about Boniface as a composer was propagated by one person mainly, mainly on both. So who was he? What is his backstory? He studied piano in Amsterdam, also worked as a piano teacher in a school in Amsterdam. He attended some lectures in musicology as a guest listener. And even before coming to South Africa, he published on both on Western music in South Africa and also on Afrikaans folk music. Starting in 1946, Die Musik in South Africa and the Afrikaans Volkslied. In 1960, he becomes a lecturer and also the director of the Institute for Volksmusik at Stellenbosch University. And he continues to publish in those two areas, so both in the Western music of South Africa and in Afrikaans folk music. He gets his PhD in 1965, which was later published as Die Musiklehre in Kapstadt. And he retires from Stellenbosch University in 1972. Bose's output shows this interesting combination of work on folk traditions and also Western classical or Western music traditions. If we take a closer look, we can see that not only was the institute created for him um, and it closes down when he leaves, even before he writes, he gets honors from the Akademie für Wirtschaften Kunst. And then also once he arrives here, he's, there's a veritable shower of honors given to him by the FRK and again by the Academy. So I suspect he must have had massive connections into the Africana cultural elite. And this for me casts a slight shadow on his writings. So was the story about Boniface politically motivated, maybe even ideologically? Because both is basically in search for Africana history, both in terms of uh, folk traditions and also in terms of Western music. But looking at the primary evidence, Boniface is not really suitable as for the title of first South African composer. He is French by birth, first of all, and if you take composition to be the writing down of original music, then he wasn't a composer. Perhaps that definition is actually too limiting, even for Western music. Boniface was working in a tradition, in a convention, and using this convention to create new plays with music. But then again, if we widen the definition of composition or composer, then Boniface was definitely not the first. Let's have a look at some other contenders. Reading South African, not so much as a state, but rather as a region. Two contenders are here at the beginning of the 19th century, so about the same time as Boniface, um, whose music has been written down in Western notation. In Sikana, he was one of the early Christian converts among the Kosa. He ran his own services and composed hymns for them, both in words and music. And those words and music were handed down orally by oral tradition, 
and written down in the late 19th century by John Knox Bockwe in sulfur notation. And here you see one of the early prints of and Kana's great hymn. Another contender might be this unknown Gora player. This picture of a Gora player comes from Birchall's travels to the interior of southern Africa. And it contains notation. So someone took the trouble to listen to this person and to write down what he played. However, it's not quite clear how accurate this transcription is because we don't know how trained that writer down was. And also, looking at these two composers opens the field even wider. So these composers didn't write down the music, it was other people and it was often much later. So what about composers that, whose music was never written down? Well, we can go back even further. Um, because there's no musical notation, we can look at other sources. For example, written sources. The so-called Diary of Vasco da Gama describes a music-making scene in South Africa in the late 15th century. Again, here, a caveat, this source is highly problematic. It's definitely not written by Vasco da Gama. And there's only a 16th century copy extant, so it's quite far removed from the actual happening. And, of course, here too, it's not clear whether the person who wrote it down actually understood what he was seeing, so whether he was musically educated. Let's take one more step back. Again, we get other sources mostly iconographic or material evidence, the further back we go. Here we've got a picture, an icon iconographic source of a bow player, and we can definitely tell that this is a musical bow, because the person is first of all sitting down, um, you wouldn't do that if you want to shoot an arrow, and also the bow is held the wrong way around, so the string is facing outward rather than to the body, and you also see at the bottom a resonator attached to the bow. So this is definitely a musical bow. It comes from the rock art near McClear in the Drakensberg. This is as far as I want to go back in my search for the first South African composer. I now would like to hand over to my learned colleague, Professor Winfried Ludemann. He could take you further back even more because he researches music and evolution. But here I say thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Sandmeyer. Um, to, to give the vote of thanks, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Winfried Ludemann. Professor Ludemann is uh, now emeritus professor from the University of Stellenbosch. He was the head of department of musicology there. And he also has, uh, his, his focus of, of research is uh, historical musicology and specifically in South Africa. So he and Professor Sandmeyer have had uh, overlapping interests and it's a great pleasure to welcome him. Um, of course, our two music schools are fierce competitors and uh, always uh, one tr claiming to be better than the other. But this shows that we can collaborate and we can be friends across the river as well. And it's a great pleasure to have you with us to do the honor of the vote of thanks. I invite you to the podium. Uh, dear Vi uh, Vice-Chancellor, Dr. Price, dear Professor David Wardle, dear Professor Sandmeyer, dear Professor, um, I don't have my glasses on, I hope I'm Pa King, I hope I've got it right, and dear members of the audience, 
Uh, it not only gives me great pleasure to introduce a vote of thanks to Professor Zandmeyer for an outstanding inaugural lecture. It is, it is also a matter of great honor for me to have been asked to do so. Since I am from the neighboring university, the one uh, you said be across the river, I would say behind the mountain, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, nevertheless, I regard Professor Zandmeyer as much as a colleague as you do and therefore I feel confident to speak on your behalf as well. She is a fellow musicologist of international repute, and ad I admire her work greatly, some of which I have read. I have also had the privilege to hear her present papers on several occasions before. Not only that, I came to know her considerable managerial skills as well, as a fellow head of department at the time when I occupied a similar position in Stellenbosch. We had regular friendly and collegial exchanges on matters of common concern. Despite her modest bearing, she is a person of stature, and you are privileged indeed to have her on your staff and, and in your university. Uh, Professor Zandmeyer has published on a wide variety of topics, notably on English music. Her inaugural lecture on an aspect of South African music history of, is of special significance since, since it indicates that she is bringing her research skills and, equally important, her research integrity to bear on a South African topic, one that has become quite contested in recent times. As someone engaged in South African music history and music myself, I look forward greatly to her further contribution to this field. If I say that the historiography of South African music is contested, I'm not only referring to the normal revision that all music historical knowledge has to, go, has to undergo from time to time, and where she is, and sorry, and where the present juncture in our cultural and intellectual life calls for such revision strong, uh, more strongly than before. I'm also referring to the way in which such work is conducted. In some cases, it is done in a matter that raises serious questions about research ethics. Professor Zandmeyer's integrity as a researcher should serve as an example to those who do not mind disregarding basic ethical principles when they pursue their dubious agenda under the cloak of critical musicological research. Her presentation this evening reminds us once again how important it is to be able to back up your work with evidence that stands up to scrutiny. That she could show up a mistake of far-reaching importance made by Jan Bose, one of the most respected pioneers of South African music history, is indicative of her keen eye for what is right, her courage, her thoroughness, and her rigor. In defense of Jan Bose, I would like to say that he was generally a meticulous scholar, but in his eagerness to write a South African or Africana music history, he did overshoot the target on several occasions. Another example worth quoting in this context is the following statement, probably more indicative of haste and carelessness than anything else, taken from the first page of his book, Sulang Dar Musik Is, and I quote directly, Saumidi Stichters, the, the book begins like this. Saumidi Stichters van die nedersetting aan die kaap, die goeie hoop, het die muziekbeoefening gekom. Dagelijkse psalmgesange en militaire muziek vir die militaire oefeninge aan die fort. Uh, in English, uh, roughly translated, uh, together with the, the first uh, settlers in the Cape, came music to the Cape. As if there was no musical activity in South Africa before Jan van Riebeek came to the Cape. The opposite is rather true. When we consider the evolution of the human species, we learn that the cradle of Homo sapiens is in Africa. Some would even say Southern Africa, if the currently known fossil and archaeological record is anything to go by. One of the earliest records of hominids who were capable of symbolic thinking which includes the capacity for language and, of course, music, comes from the Blombos and other caves in the southern coast of the Western Cape, approximately 80,000 years ago. So I'm uh, 
how can I say, um, even extending your period further backwards. Uh, so, as humans so, as humans dispersed out of Africa and over the rest of the world, they would have taken language and music with them wherever they went, including, eventually, to the Netherlands, where Jan van Riebeek and Jan Boos came from. Uh, in the meantime, humans who remained behind in Africa continued to develop and practice music here. The highly complex social and artistic extent to which they did so was shown by John Blacking, in his seminal book on the musical culture of the Venda people of South Africa, uh, with the title, How Musical is Man? I think that is a very uh, pointed title. So the exact opposite of what Bose wrote is true. Musically, as in other respects, we are all Africans, and we did not need van Riebeek to bring music here. On the other hand, the music that he did represent did add to the rich diversity that is South African music today. But instead of discrediting the work of Bose as a whole, we should learn from this example how important it is not to get carried away by your research, not to make irresponsible statements, or to produce findings that cannot be corroborated, and above all, to be self-critical of your research agenda. Realizing that all views of, on music are historically and culturally relative and contingent should make us more humble and critical about our own views, which could look particularly vulnerable from the perspective of future hindsight. How to produce research of integrity was demonstrated in an exemplary fashion this evening by Professor Zandmeier. On behalf of everyone present here, Rebecca, I should like to thank you for your fascinating presentation and congratulate you on your appointment as a professor of this illustrious university, according to the ratings, the best in Africa. Uh, the University of Cape Town certainly has appointed a scholar of the highest caliber. Not only should they be proud of you, I hope that they will fulfill their obliga obligation to you as a researcher and continue to support your work and that of your department to the full. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that you on the, is that your motorbike there? I'm just checking. <laughs> Whose motorbike is that on the? Yes, of course it's Okay, I'm just. <laughs> it wasn't mentioned in the introduction or in the vote of thanks, so I thought we needed to. <laughs> Um, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you, Professor Ludemann, and thank you, uh, Professor Sandmeyer, for a really interesting talk and for reminding us um, of the need to question and challenge the, 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 the perspectives that we um, have often grown up with uh, and with blinkers. Ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to join us for some uh, snacks, refreshments, and where you'll be able to congratulate Professor Sandmeyer yourself and... Uh, talk to her more about the lecture. Thank you all very much for coming. Thanks for the performance. Normally we're all sitting here and we can go out first, but uh, we're now a bit scattered, so let's all go out together. We're not a big crowd. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>